So good morning and welcome. This is our fifth and final event in our biodiversity on our doorstep series, which has been running all week, organized by us here at Europe Direct Waterford and Waterford Libraries. So this morning we are joined by Oshin Duffy from the National Biodiversity Data Centre based here in Waterford, who is going to explain how we can spot 20 easily identified spring flowers and become citizen scientists and record our findings. So Oshin is the Surveys and Records Officer with the National Biodiversity Data Centre, and he's responsible for the management of Ireland's citizen science a portal. So I'm very delighted to, to welcome Oshin here with us today. Thank you, Sinead. Now, are you good to, to start there, Oshin? Yeah, perfect. That's excellent. We all good to go? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Excellent. So yeah, as uh, Sinead said, uh, my name is Ashin Duffy. I'm the Surveys and Records Officer with the National Biodiversity Data Centre. And today we're going to be looking at the Spring Flower and Plants Project and Ireland Citizen Science Portal. So I suppose a little bit of background probably goes a long way. Um, some of you might not be aware at all of the National Biodiversity Data Centre, but it's a national centre for the collection, collation, management, uh, analysis and dissemination of data on Ireland's biological diversity. Now that sounds quite highfalutin, but basically what it is, is uh, people can submit sightings of different uh, flora and fauna, uh, you know, plants and animals that are found throughout the country, um, submit them to us. Uh, they go through a process of validation and verification, and eventually we're able to uh, create distribution maps for all the species that are found in Ireland. So the very first step in that is that records are submitted through um, the Citizen Ireland Citizen Science Portal. And that allows you to send in records for basically anything that can be found in Ireland that's, um, that, that you can record. So um, there's kind of two parts to it. There's really Ireland Citizen Science Portal and Biodiversity Maps. So you can see over on the, the right hand side of the screen, you can see just uh, two screen grabs from those. And basically the Citizen Science Portal is, uh, it collects biodiversity data through a suite of dedicated online recording forms. So if your particular interest is in um, birds or if it's in vascular plants or if it's in butterflies, you, there's a, a dedicated recording form for that. Um, here today, we're mainly going to be focusing on the spring flowers. But again, if your interest is, is in something else, if you have an interest in birds or if you have an interest in, in butterflies or bees or whatever, um, those also have dedicated recording forms. So the records come in through that system and then uh, they go to us uh, in the center or they go to external validators for um, verification and validation. And that basically just means that there's um, someone that's, that's a specialist in a, a particular taxonomic group, or there's a, an expert that goes through and basically checks to make sure that the record is correct. Um, because sometimes it's as simple as inputting the wrong species name by mistake, or sometimes it is that people get the, the species wrong and we can, we can kind of give feedback on that then. So once all that process has been completed, it goes on to a thing called biodiversity maps. So this acts as our validated database and also acts as um, basically a, a kind of a, a center or a portal for um, showing all the distribution maps for um, species found in Ireland. And it's all freely available online. And the, the data comes from a lot of different sources. So it's, a lot of the data comes from the citizen science portal, but there's also professional ecologists and different scientists and academics that are feeding into this process as well. So um, just a little bit more, it's, it's data is one of the, the big things, but a lot of it is on uh, conservation and kind of just the, the general kind of state of the environment as well. So there's a whole suite of um, recording initiatives and recording schemes and monitoring schemes as well that the data center runs. And just to kind of give you a quick flavor of, of some of those where there's ones for uh, butterfly and bumblebee. So the butterfly monitor scheme, it uh, needs people to walk a, a transect or a fixed route uh, once a week, whereas the bumblebees uh, require someone to walk that transect once a month. Uh, you have dragonfly Ireland, which records uh, species of dragonflies and damselflies. Um, you also have Explore Your Shore, which covers all of the kind of kind of shore based. So if you're in, if you're lucky enough to be a uh, 5K that's near the coast, then that project might be of interest to you. And we also have ones that are kind of more specialist or niche for people that are um, for you know kind of more kind of expert recorders, and that would be stuff like the rare plant monitoring scheme. 
Um, but today we're going to be focusing uh, on the spring flower and plants. And really that's one of these uh, projects that's really good for entry level. Um, so if you've never done any kind of recording before, this is a great project to get involved with. Um, so just a little bit of background on that. It's a, a joint initiative between the National Biodiversity Data Centre and the BSBA, the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. And it was kicked off uh, back in 2017. So um, it originally started off as 14 different uh, spring flower species and it got bumped up to 16 last year. And now we're, we're kind of settling at a 20 that are easily identifiable without too many kind of confusion species. Um, so there's a, a provision of a special online recording form and there's also a, a dedicated web a page for it as well where you can see all the stats. Um, so the information gathered through the Spring Flower and Plants project, it's important because it allows us to keep uh, an update on distribution maps for, for these particular species. And it allows us to see features as well, like flowering times, if species are um, getting more records earlier or later, that can be sometimes due to things like, um, you know, a particularly cold spring or particularly mild spring may allow, you know, plants to be flowering at, at different times. And that, that kind of, it's good for us to be able to keep track of that as well. Uh, as I said, it's an ideal project for recorders. Um, it's really ex easily accessible for beginners. Um, the 20 chosen species, you might not have heard of all of them. You might have heard of some of them. Um, they're all uh, wildflowers. So um, it's it's not a case that there's going to be things like daffodils and, and crocus and snowdrops and things like that that are that planted in the garden. It's, it's going to be ones that you actually kind of find out in the wild. Uh, the majority of them are native, but there are a few species that are non-native and some that are almost considered invasive as well. Then it's, it's kind of good to keep tabs on those because they're right before a lot of the older flowers are actually um, actually out. There's identification guides, species profiles, and there's regular posts on our social media as well that can really help recorders with any kind of species identification. Because when you start off, like lots of things look the same. <laughs> That's the thing, they, they, might, they might seem um, very different to someone who's been doing it for, for years, but um, they, a lot of these things can look similar when you're starting off. Um, the last thing then is it's it's one thing to actually go out and, and see these things and record them. The, the next part is it actually submitting your data. Uh, and once you're comfortable that you've recorded something correctly, you can you can submit it through the, the actual citizen science portal. So I suppose the next thing is to actually get on to the actual species that we're talking about. And we're just going to run down through the, the 20 different species that we have. Um, first up on the list are bluebells. They're a very characteristic flower of spring, uh, carpets the, you know, the woodland floor. Um, the only real kind of uh, species that you can mix this up well is that there is a, a Spanish bluebell and um, some, of the, uh, some of the planted varieties of bluebells as well, they can uh, hybridize with the native species. But when you see um, lot, you know, long carpets of the bluebells in the, in the woodlands and they all have a, a flowering head which is drooping over to, on one side, then you can, you're, you're fairly kind of uh, happy enough that it's, um, that it's the native bluebell. But again, there are lots of ID guides online and things like that. So if you do have any kind of issue with, with knowing for certain, then you can just check one of those. Uh, next up on the top right hand corner is uh, the common dog violet. So uh, you can see that there's a common dog violet and an early dog violet. Now again, when you're out in the field, these two things look can, can look quite similar, but there's a few little tips and tricks that can kind of get you through it. So you can see behind the actual flower, there is a, a notched spur and it's generally um, always white in color. And you can see behind the early dog violet, it's not a notched spur, but it's also purple. So there are kind of features that you can look out for in the field. The other one is as well is that uh, something like common dog violet, you can see there's small little maps down here. And basically the more heavily you can see the, the colors, the yellows and the reds, that means there's squares off um, the plant, uh, where the plant has actually been recorded from. Uh, and, and in regards to common dog violet, you can see that it is actually much more common than something like early dog violet. This one is, is slightly, slightly less common. Um, over on the bottom left hand side here, we have the early purple orchid. So um, it's a real treat if you get to see this one in, in your local area. Um, it's generally out as well before many of the other orchids. The, the orchids generally you'd be kind of thinking of would be the, the kind of the common spotted or the marsh orchids and things like that. And they're generally kind of flowering more throughout uh, June and July. So if you're getting something that's flowering in April, there's a very good chance that it's early purple orchid. And one of the one of the features that's easy to tell with it is that behind the flower as well, it has a, an upward um, point spur. Um, you can actually see it in this photo. So this is the, the actual flower itself. And, it, and behind here, you can see all the spurs uh, pointing upwards. So again, um, 
we're really kind of looking, basically it's kind of really March to May is the main time for spring flowers, but already there's a lot that are already out. Um, through our through the, the Spring Flowers project already, where there's over about 500 records that have been submitted, and they're mainly for species like um, Lesser Celandine and Winter Heliotrope, which we'll be covering now shortly as well. So one that probably is quite common to people would be something like wild garlic, and this is something that uh, when you're if you're walking through the woods when this is in flower around kind of April and May, you get the a kind of a beautiful smell, a strong smell of garlic. Um, again, the, the only confusion really with something like wild garlic would be something like three cornered garlic. Now the flowers don't necessarily look alike, but it's the fact that they, they both do smell of garlic. So there's uh, one of your senses is, is gone down there. So you kind of might have to look a little bit closer at the, at the flowers. So wild garlic, again, similar enough in a way to bluebells, it kind of carpets the woodland floors. It has um, uh, multiple kind of uh, star, white star shaped flowers. And again, the leaves are quite broad, belt-like, um, compared to something like three-cornered leek, which is actually a, a non-native species. Um, it, it can uh, become in, in nearly invasive in some areas as well, but the stems on that are uh, three-sided and also the, the leaves are strongly keeled, so they have a kind of a, a deep ridge on them, what makes them look three-sided as well. Um, you would usually get the three-cornered garlic growing alongside um, kind of walls, roadsides, pathways, and things like that. And it seems to be relatively hardy as well, it produces small um, kind of baubles as well, um, which you can see later on in the year. One that I'm sure probably everyone is, is um, very familiar with is uh, primrose. And uh, primrose is, there, there's nothing really that looks quite like primrose. Um, and you'll get this kind of growing along, uh, you know, roadside banks, it even grows in gardens, it even, even apart from ones that you plant yourself, it can pop up in especially kind of banking areas. Um, and along roadsides, really. Um, it's kind of a, a kind of pale cream, yellowy kind of color. And it always generally has that uh, deeper yellow orange color on in the in the middle of the flower. And you can see from the distribution map of primrose that it's that it's an extremely common plant. Basically, it's it's found in in every square, you know, nearly everywhere in Ireland, bar the, the kind of mountainous areas in, in Donegal and, and Mayo and a few spots like that. In the same family as Primrose, we have a uh, cowslip. And again, this is one that if you're in kind of the, the northwest or northeast of the country, you're probably not going to be as familiar with. Um, so it's probably not going to be one that, that, that you're seeing regularly. But cowslip uh, further down the country and around um, from kind of Waterford and Tipperary, you might even see this growing along uh, roundabouts or I might even see it kind of along roadsides and that as well. And it's a, it's a beautiful looking flower. Um, kind of a long stem and multiple flowering heads, uh, much darker in color than, than the primrose and much smaller are kind of grouped together and generally kind of fall over on one side as well. You can see something just uh, here on the three cornered garlic as well. You can see that this has a very strong uh, southeasterly distribution. It is found in other areas, but the, the general kind of thing of it is on the, on the southeast. So this is where we're coming into some of the more uh, kind of charismatic species. Uh, we have wood anemone. Um, this is found uh, generally flowering between kind of March and May. Uh, again, it can as well carpet the woodland floor. And uh, it's generally um, six petaled uh, flower. Um, there are planted varieties of this. So just take a look at it, at the flower um, first. And, and, and if you see lots of them carpeting the woodland floor and it's white, generally behind the flower, there can be a slight pinky kind of tinge to the flower as well. And uh, it, it can be found in a, in a, in a, a lot of different um, kind of woodlands around um, probably kind of in your locality. It's also worth noting as well that the the uh, Irish name on this is um, kind of like a plant of the wind because of how, how it moves when the wind kind of blows through the woodlands. So there's a, you'll notice for all the species that we have, they all have their, their English or their common name. They all have their, um, they all have their uh, scientific name, which is generally in, in Latin, and they all have their, their Irish name here as well. The next one over on the right hand side is the one that's actually been it's the most recorded species of plant in Ireland in 2021 so far is uh, Lesser Celandine and it's already flowering well throughout the country um, thinking on roadsides even in kind of uh, near rivers uh, even in woodlands and even to be honest you get some hardy ones that are kind of growing near the tops of walls or, or anywhere where it gets an opportunity. So again it's generally um, one of the first ones to come out a uh, really distinctive um, yellow flower. And if you're thinking that it looks, you know, kind of slightly similar to maybe some of the kind of the buttercups or it has the same kind of the hue, you know, the hue of the color is it is in the same family as buttercup. 
Um, but it is, uh, it's, it's a beautiful species and you can see from the distribution map that it is found virtually, virtually everywhere as well. Um, one of the other features to look out for the, with this plant is that uh, the leaves are uh, pretty much kidney shaped. So um, the only other species you can mix that up with is something like uh, one of the violets before it's in flower. So if you see the kidney shaped leaves and you see this uh, kind of yellow flower uh, flowering at this stage, there's, there's really nothing else it could be. Uh, bottom left here, we have uh, cuckoo's flower, also known as lady smock. And uh, this is a really interesting flower because um, it flowers between April and June. And it's also the larval food plant of the orange tip butterfly. So uh, if you have, um, if you've ever seen a, a butterfly in Ireland that's white and it has uh, yellowy orange tips to the wings, then, then that's, that's the male of the species. And it's really interesting because uh, depending on the kind of spring that you have and, and going into the summer, um, Basically, the, the orange tips uh, life cycle is completely dependent on when this uh, plant comes out. So if the orange tip emerges uh, too early uh, and there's not and there's no other flower around, they don't actually have anything to lay the egg on. They might have to go to another plant um, that's that's not as suitable or they might have to go to one that's not as um, uh, that's not as well grown. Uh, and if they come out too late, then they're uh, then the eggs have already been laid on it. And generally, it's it should be kind of one egg per plant because uh, the, the, the caterpillars, they, they generally don't play nice. They're actually cannibalistic on each other. So it's, uh, it's, it's well worth taking a look, particularly kind of around um, mid-April and, and May to take a look at actually at the flowers. Uh, if you take a look behind the actual flower and head itself, you might notice a small, very, very small orange egg. You might need something like a hand lens or a, or a magnifying glass to see it or if you have a good, if you have a good camera. Generally, it can be found in um, kind of wet, damp habitats, but it can also be found in kind of in gardens as well. So it's one to definitely look out for. The leaves of that look very similar to a, to a cress that is in the, the cress family. Over on this bottom right hand side, we have a uh, wood sorrel. So um, this has a, a very, very, very distinctive plant, even when it's not in flower, um, because it has a very distinctive um, kind of shamrock shaped or trifoliate leaves. And uh, trifoliate just means that the leaves are in, in three different leaflets. And uh, it's grow it, it can carpet kind of areas of woodland. You'll even see it growing on um, old, uh, old tree stumps and things like that. And uh, the, the flower is actually usually very delicate and can be often quite difficult to get a decent picture of it because uh, when you're in woodlands in particular, there's actually not that much light getting through. Um, so it's, it's a white flower and the veins on it are very kind of uh, delicate purple lilac color. So if you, if you, it's well worth uh, checking out if you're in a woodland area, you'll generally have this. So um, a few of the probably less uh, well-known ones are on the, 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 the top left-hand side here, uh, toothwort. Um, this is actually probably one of the things about the Spring Flowers project is that while it's, you know, great for beginners to kind of get involved with, it also, um, you know, has challenges in there for, for botanists that have been doing stuff for, for many of the year. So uh, toothwort is, it's an unusual looking plant which actually parasitizes the roots of trees. And uh, you get these kind of um, tubular flowers that come out uh, all on one side with a white pink kind of color. You can you kind of get with it where it got the name toothwort. Um, it, it does look very distinctive um, and there's not, too, there's not nothing really else that looks like it. Um, so that's probably unlikely to find that in your in your five kilometer area, um, unless you're in one of the areas here on the on the distribution map. And the other thing about it is it doesn't always um, doesn't always come up in the same area area every year as well. So it is one of these ones that can be can be there one year and might not necessarily be there the the next. Uh, on the top right hand corner, we have a plant called uh, Lords and Ladies or Cuckoo's Pint. Um, this is a, a species that actually has about, I think it's about 150 different common names, depending on where you are in, in, in the country. So there's a, a ton of different names on it. At the minute, um, all you'll be seeing are these um, distinctive kind of broad, glossy green arrow shaped leaves. Um, you'll notice these kind of growing along the woodland floor in small clumps. It'll be a little bit later before um, we're in kind of April and May before we actually notice the, the very distinctive uh, flower that comes up. So it has um, almost kind of lily-like. Um, so it's, it's not something you, you would mix up um, with anything else. There are garden varieties and there are planted varieties of the species as well. They, they can look quite similar, but if you look for the, the dark green lossy leaves and the, and the, the actual flower itself, 
um, there shouldn't be too many issues. And especially if it's growing in a woodland, you can see it is, it's quite, quite common there from the distribution map. The other thing that's uh, interesting about this species is that um, later on the season when it's actually gone to seed, it, um, it, the berries change in color from a, a dark green color to kind of a yellowy orange and then ending in a really distinctive red. So you might notice the stock and it has um, tons of small red berries all around. The one thing probably just to point out as well, particularly if you're doing anything with, with uh, if you're doing stuff with your kids with the species, is that this particular species is poisonous. So it's um, best not to, not to be um, handling it or, or you know, just make, make people aware that that particular species is, is for all parts of the plant are, are poisonous. Uh, on the bottom left hand corner here, it's a species that I'd say people are probably become more and more aware of because it's, uh, it kind of can take over areas of roadside very easily, particularly where, where um, work has gone on and, and ground has been kind of chewed up and stuff like that. It, it allows for kind of spread. It's a winter heliotrope. And um, it's, we've added in as the spring flowers, even though it, uh, it kind of flowers from November, really, November and December. So it's one of the few species you'll actually find flowering um, fully in, in early in the year. It's a non-native species and it can quickly take over things like laneways and roadsides. So areas that you might have walked down in previous years where there was just ordinary vegetation with a few different plants um, in flower, this can kind of completely kind of shade it out. And you can see that it has very large um, kidney shaped or some people say heart shaped leaves. The other um, feature about it, apart from the fact that they're, they're generally kind of growing quite uh, big clumps, is that um, it's very sweet smelling. So uh, some people can consider it like a vanilla or licorice or aniseed. So it is, it is worthwhile just to, to give a, if you're in any doubt, you should be able to kind of smell the plant if you get down beside it. So at the bottom right hand side here, we have a coltsfoot. And it's a really, really distinctive one um, because it flowers, one, it flowers early. Um, two, there's not much else in flower uh, at this time of year that looks quite like it. And three, um, it flowers before the leaves are present. So that's a, a really kind of uh, interesting one because some people will look at that from a distance and think, oh, it's a dandelion. Um, but the thing about it is if you walk up to the plant, you'll notice that there's no leaves present, whereas the dandelion has that kind of distinctive um, kind of serrated uh, leaf. So if you, if you find something that you're, you're not, it doesn't quite look like a dandelion, but it's flowering, especially if it's flowering in a, in a clump, uh, like what you can see here on the right hand side. Just take a look to see. The other feature on it is that the stem itself has um, these kind of leaf scales. And um, there it's kind of like, a, it looks very scaly along the, along the actual stem of the plant. Um, so the, it's, it's, it's in flower now at the minute. And to be honest, it's, it's one of these ones that's it's quite a hardy plant. You'll notice it coming up in kind of uh, gravelly areas, even at the edge of car parks and things like that. If there's any kind of uh, rough ground, you'll notice it popping up. And um, it can even pop up in gardens and bankings and things like that as well. So we're on to the, the four new additions to the project this year. And uh, one of them, I'd say, unless basically you're in the burn um, or in the West, you're probably not going to have to worry about it. So if you're, if you're tuning in from Waterford, you can leave this one out of your head. Uh, but it's the spring gentian. And this is a, a really distinctive looking uh, flower. There's nothing else quite like it. And it's probably one of the species that's most associated with uh, that the burn's best known for. It's a bright blue five petal flower. And to be honest, there's, there's nothing else that looks quite like it. Um, top right hand corner, we have common whitlow grass. And this is a really, really tiny one. Um, you can see the distribution map for it. Uh, it, it doesn't look like it's, it's, it's extremely common, but it can be found in kind of uh, waste grounded areas, um, can also be kind of found in kind of gravelly or really dry bare ground areas. And you'll often find it near almost the, the start of, um, uh, almost at the near the start of beaches where there's a bit of kind of hard ground near the car park as well. And one of the reasons that, that the, the distribution for it is, is so few is that sometimes it's very easily overlooked. I mean, this is a, it's a really, really tiny plant. You're talking probably the flower is probably the, the size of the fingernail on, on, your, on your little finger. Um, but it's, it's a good one. Um, the bottom, the last two that we have now, bottom left hand side is, is Alexander's and it's uh, a member of the same family as things like carrot and hogweed. And uh, it's a distinctive, it has kind of yellowy green flowers and it's flowering now at this stage. So uh, out before any of the other um, umbellifers are, are out properly. 
Uh, the leaves are also dark and glossy green, uh, uh, glossy green and the, the plant also has a distinctive kind of smell, uh, almost kind of like a, a spicy kind of celery type smell. So this one is, is flowering currently um, uh, kind of in roadsides, laneways, and even in kind of uh, uh, areas of woodland. The bottom right hand side, opposite leaf golden saxifrage, don't worry, it's, it's easier to identify than it is to say. Uh, it flowers from March to July, and generally you can find this low grown plant it carpets areas and it can be a very small carpet of an area um, but it's generally kind of in the damp shaded areas of woodlands but it can also come up if you have a small um, area in your garden that's very uh, very damp and a bit kind of waterlogged you can often find this plant actually um, coming up in it um, so i suppose the the distribution maps for for these species you can see that these ones have been added in just for one to see if there's any any gaps where we can where we can get more records for and two just to have a, a little bit of a diversity in there of the the plants that we're actually seeing so i suppose that's that's the the welcome to the 20 that that are there um the next thing is is then what do you actually do when when you see these and you're confident that, that, that you've seen them so so as the first step is there's only really two steps to it, I suppose. It's uh, go out and look for the spring flowers. And uh, then once you're happy with the identification, you come and you input the record. So from that, you go to Ireland Citizen Science Portal. Uh, and don't worry, all the, the links that are featured in this uh, are also going out in a, an email as well that'll be going out uh, after the talk. Once you go to Ireland Citizen Science Portal, you go to the start recording and you'll go to the spring flowers recording form. It's near the bottom of the page. Um, and then basically you just have to fill in the form. So what, what you actually need to put in, there's this um, it's kind of a saying in biological recording that you need the, the, four, the four W's and that's um, you know, the who, what, when, where. So in this case, the, the who is your name and email address. And uh, it's generally best to put in like your full name and then a, an email, your corresponding email address. Uh, this is generally just so for the validation verification process so that if you do input a record, and um, we need to contact you on, you know, something about, say, if there's an issue or we need uh, further information or something like that, that, that we're able to do it. Uh, the when is the date that you made the observation. So um, whatever date that you're um, making the observation, you just have to, you just have to change that on the actual site. So the site will always be put up for the day, um, the day that you, that you log on. So for today, it'll always be the 26th of February. If you go on tomorrow, it'll be the 27th. So just make sure to actually put in the correct date that you've seen the record. Uh, where, the, that's the location name, the county, and then a spatial reference. Um, this can either be, you know, like a lat long or a grid reference. And don't worry, you don't need any uh, GPS or any kind of fancy skills for it. There's a, a map of Ireland that's on the right-hand corner here. And you basically zoom into the location that, you, that you're in. So if you're in Waterford, you'll kind of keep uh, zooming in on the map until you're in, you're in your particular area. And then you just simply click on the map and it'll actually uh, generate the spatial reference for you. And then the very last one and probably the most important thing of the whole lot is the actual species name. And again, if you're, um, don't worry about if, if you're struggling with the names or anything like that, you don't have to know, you don't have to be a scholar or Latin to, to input any of these things. They all have the common names in there as well. So um, the other one thing that I would suggest as well is that if, um, if you can input a record or if you can put a, a species, um, like a photo with the, with the record that you're inputting, uh, you can do that on the recording form as well. So even if you take it with your phone, you can, you can upload it. Uh, the other way that you can also input records is through the Biodiversity Data Capture app. Um, this allows for you to record um, in the field, like live recording, but doesn't allow you to put in any records retrospectively. So if you're out for a walk and you see something, you can just do it on the app. Um, if you're if you're doing uh, if you're seeing lots of different species at the same time and you're and you're taking a note of them or you kind of remember where they are, you can come back and you can do it through the actual um, computer web page then. So just as an example there, um, so you know the who is your name, so Ashley Duffy, and then my email address. The when is the actual date, the 26th of February, 2021 where I just put it in for where the data center is based in Carrigonore, Waterford, and the spatial reference again is gotten from the map. And then what is uh, Coltsfoot, so, um, and then it just has the, the scientific name after it. And the last thing that you do then, if all that is, is complete, is you just press the save record button uh, bottom at the bottom, and that should be you. Uh, it's, 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 it might sound kind of daunting for the first time that you're doing these things, especially when there's 20 species. But again, in your area, there may only be three or four of them that are actually in flower at the moment. So that's uh, pretty much, I suppose, all um, 
that's just a quick introduction to the thing and we can open it up to any questions that anyone has. Thanks, Oshin. That 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 was brilliant. Lots to uh, lots to consider there. So there's, I see a few questions coming in already. So if you would like to ask Oshin a question, if you pop it into the um, Q and A box at the bottom there, and any comments then can be put in the chat box. So that was really interesting, Oshin. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of questions after coming in already. So the first is one is from somebody who has already been recording their. Um, on bird tracks and eBird, and they just wondering, does they share their information with the NBDC yourselves, um, or should they be submitting it separately? Well, it's it's I suppose for a lot of those, it's it's almost on a, a case by case basis. So um, we would actually probably need to check with the particular validator for those um, for kind of the bird group to actually see um, whether there's a, there's a data share agreement. There is a lot of data share agreements in place. I mean, uh, say for the, like the spring flowers, the BSBI and the data center are sharing records, but um, if they want to send a, uh, an email into the info ad account, uh, which will be included in the email afterwards as well, that's something we can follow up with them. Perfect. Um, but if there, if there is a data sharing agreement in place, then generally you only have to put it in one thing because you want to cut down the amount of uh, duplicate records that come in as well. That's great. And um, then somebody wants to know if they want to rewild their garden, what would be the best way to get seeds for the plants that you've highlighted today? Right. So I suppose for, for rewilding a garden, um, the, I suppose there's there's kind of two ways that you can really kind of do it. One is is just to leave everything alone for, for a while and actually just let everything just go a bit wild for a few months. Um, if the, the thing about the spring flowers plants that you, that we're seeing there is that because they are, are wild, they might not necessarily come up in gardens. A lot of them are woodland species. So unless your garden kind of borders a woodland, you're probably not going to, it's not the really kind of suitable habitat for them. Um, if you're interested in um, kind of planting species that will help biodiversity, one of the things you could do is check out the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. So this uh, particularly uh, is focused on creating habitats in gardens, in community groups and things like that, that are beneficial to our pollinator species, which are mainly, you know, bees, butterflies, hoverflies, and things like that. And one of the knock-on effects is that if you're creating better habitat for pollinators, you're generally creating better habitat for biodiversity in general as well. So you can you can find all that out at uh, pollinators.ie. It's uh, by the National Biodiversity Data Center as well, the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. Yeah, or they could always watch back our video from Tuesday of earlier in this week when our horticulturist at Waterford Council was yeah. talking about the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, and that's on the Europe Direct channel on YouTube. So people can find that there. Just a little plug in. One yeah. <laughs> um, somebody wants to know: Are there ways to control winter heliotrope without using chemicals? Stop it taking over. Yeah, that's it's an interesting one. Um, I, I, I'm not as hundred percent certain what the best way of actually of, of, of kind of controlling the species is, um, but it, it definitely can have invasive qualities. Probably someone like um, Invasive Species Ireland might be the best to address with them. Um, we, we generally don't kind of give advice on, on the controlling of the species because a lot of times, even if, if a species is kind of considered invasive, it can be on a case by case basis. Um, but it's definitely probably worth something following up with someone like um, Invasive Species Ireland. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody here wants to know, is there a print a page that people can print out with all the flowers that you mentioned there? So just like a single page with them all on it? It's available to kind of download and print out? Uh, there, there, we're developing, um, we're kind of developing uh, more ID resources at the minute. So there will be, if, if they go on to the Spring Flower and Plants page, we do have a uh, an ID guide that, that people can uh, download. Um, for printing as such, we could we could develop something like that very handily as well. Um, but if they go on to the on the actual spring flowers plant website, which which we will include in the, the email that goes after the talk, um, there should be enough. We don't actually have anything for like a tick the box kind of thing, but if that's something that there's enough interest, then in, we could we could easily develop something like that as well. Okay. Um, somebody here wants to know: Have you any top tips for what you could, if you can plant any of the plants in the garden? So any of the wildflower ones there, or tips um, for gardening? wildlife in general i suppose you kind of answered that there a bit already yeah i, I suppose with um like on, unless they're already there um and unless you're kind of willing to go and collect seed and, and collecting seed it's one of those things that sounds easy but there, it can be a little bit trickier and then again unless you have the right habitat for it it's it's not always 
it's not always there. Generally, what the things that are found in your garden, I mean, a lot of people look at, think that they have, you know, weeds by having dandelions or, you know, bits of clover popping up, but they're fantastic plants as well. Like, and, and they're, they're all kind of, 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 of equal value. Okay. Um, somebody else wants to know, have you any books that you would recommend people to use? Yeah, so um, I suppose outside, if uh, if you're talking outside of the actual um, the resources that are on the National Biodiversity Data Centre, uh, Zoe Devlin's Wildflowers of Ireland is a fantastic book. Um, it's great to be honest for all uh, all levels, um, particularly if you're a beginner, kind of getting started on it. But it is one of those ones that you keep coming back to, regardless of of how much experience you have. Um, for people that have been doing uh, recording for a much longer period of time, probably the, the best book to get if you're in Ireland is um, Web Flora. So that's actually the, the, the flora of Ireland. Um, you can pick up the new copies, which are quite large, or you can pick, if you're lucky enough to pick up the older copies, you could actually take them into the field with you as well. But um, definitely Zoe Devlin's uh, Wildflowers of Ireland would be a, would be a recommendation. And I think there's, there's Collins guides as well to, to Wildflowers. There's, there's a lot of different ones out there, but uh, Zoe Devlin's is done by colour and it's kind of very easily accessible and to cover basically everything you're going to see. Oh, that's good. Um, uh, somebody wants to know, do you have to wait for the plant to flower before submitting a record? No, you don't have to. I mean, it's if if you're confident of the identification of it, um, generally, you know, if, if you're starting off, it would be something I would tell people, you know, because a lot of leaves can look similar without the actual flower and head there. But um, no, you, you can submit, uh, you can submit records Records, um, with, if, you, if, you, if you can identify it by kind of vegetatively, but just by the leaves or whatever, um, you can you can input like that as well. And somebody wants to know if they spotted something last year and didn't upload, can they still do that? Oh yeah, yeah, def yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. Um, the one thing I'll just say is that um, it is it's it's quite a common error that people input uh, records and it's for the same date. So we you know you get a bunch of records coming in in late December for for things that people seen in July. So just make sure to change the date uh, on the recording form. But yeah, you can input records at any time going back as far as you like. Perfect, that's great. Um, somebody wants to know what are the most common flowers at the moment, and then what would be the rarest. Okay, so at the moment, the most common ones would be uh, lesser celandine. So that was the, the yellow kind of um, the yellow flower that we were talking about with the kidney shaped leaves. Uh, primroses, which I'm sure probably everyone's aware of, uh, very common at the moment. Coltsfoot's becoming, um, it's, it's flowering kind of coming into its flowering period now as well. Um, the rarest ones, uh, the things like the spring gentian, even though it's not uh, technically in flower yet, the spring gentian is one of the more, one of the rarer species that we have on the, on the actual project itself. So again, for, if, if you're in Waterford, don't, don't be worrying too much about that one. Uh, early purple orchid is another, it's not so much that it's rare, it's just that it's always really nice to see things like, um, see orchids popping up. So you never know, keep your eye out. And, um, again, if you kind of get stuck for identification, you know, the, all the social media channels are there, pop it up in there and, and, you know, one of us will get back to you. Most likely me probably getting back to you about them. So, so yeah, so if we did find that Genton down here in the southeast, it would be a big, a big yeah. find. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it would, it would be rewriting the books of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody wants to know, can they record any of the wildflowers if they spot them in their own garden? Yeah, so um, if, if they are grown in your garden, the one thing generally is that if it's uh, if it's something that's been planted, we would kind of recommend it doesn't it doesn't really need to be recorded if you've planted it there yourself. Um, but yeah, if you do have, um, you know, if you've moved somewhere and you have primroses growing at the bottom of the garden, that's kind of, you know, a, a, on a kind of, you know, a bank embankment or something like that. Or if you have colt's foot growing, you know, kind of at the edge, you can input those um, definitely. Yeah. You can, if, they're, if they're found in your garden and they're and they're kind of natively or you know um they're there naturally occurring then yeah definitely input them yeah so the next one um asks can you record any insects rather than two doing two different surveys so i'm not quite sure exactly what that means i think um you will um uh, if you're looking to record other um species uh, or if you're looking to record insects as well as flowers then um you can certainly do so but you would need to go into a separate recording form so if you're out and you find um Say if you find a uh, colt's foot, and then you also find, you know, that there's a there's a bee fly past, you know, buff-tailed bumblebee flies past, and then you also see the small tortoise shell butterfly fly past. You'll you'll go on to the the three different recording forms for that. Now, if you're if you have the app, then you can do that live. So effectively, it's um, you know, as you're in the field, you can actually tap the buttons there. You know, that's buff-tailed. Then go into the next recording form. 
some people some people find the app very useful. I'm 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 a wee bit more old school myself and generally out with a piece of paper and then come back and, and put the stuff at the end of the day kind of thing. But uh, yeah, certainly you can record virtually anything uh, on the recording forms. And if you can't find the recording form you're looking for, it's most likely going to be in the other species recording form. But again, if anyone has any issues, they can just send an email and we'll get you sorted. Perfect. That's great. Um, somebody has a problem with wild garlic taking over their garden and they're just wondering how they can clear out their chemicals. Um, so but the the one thing I'd say about um, wild garlic is that uh, when we were going through the talk there, we were talking about uh, wild garlic and then three-cornered garlic, which is also sometimes known as three-cornered leek. So wild garlic is a, is a common species, uh, or sorry, is a native species and is generally kind of found in, in woodland areas. Um, three-cornered garlic is more of an it's a non-native species and it's generally more invasive um and the, the, the two are mixed up quite a lot just purely in the basis of the fact that they both have garlic in the name um so it would be interesting to know whether that person is definitely actually has wild garlic in the garden or whether it's um three cornered garlic uh i haven't really heard too much about the the ways that you can kind of get rid of them uh, i know from from experience um from where i'm living at the minute there's a lot of the three cornered garlic and uh, the kind of the small baubles that can reproduce by as well. So um, probably somewhere like if, if it is three corner garlic, then it's um, uh, then probably invasive species garden might be somewhere to kind of kind of go for it. If you have wild garlic in your garden, uh, to be honest, I, I would love to have wild garlic run in the garden. Um, it's it, it's great, but uh, yeah, if it's if it's not for you, it's not for you. I suppose. Um, so I suppose the next one is probably for Sinead. I see she has her mic back on. They want to know can they watch videos from earlier in the week. Yeah, so all of our um, talks are on our Europe Direct YouTube channel and then all of the links and the slides from the presentation are on our website waterfordlibraries.ie and then anyone who attended a talk, the, the links to, to your talk and the recordings, you, you'll get an email about that too. And then the, the next one says, I presume you're not interested in cowslip or primrose hybrids, but I presume that means can you record other flowers? besides the 20 in the program? Yeah, so I, I suppose for the spring flowering plants, it's just the 20 in the program that we're looking for and they have their own dedicated recording form. Uh, for the primrose um, cowslip hybrid, the false oxlip, um, that's something that you can certainly record on the other, it's the vascular plant recording form. And again, it's at the bottom of the page right next to the spring flowers. But if there's any other plants that you want to record, if you if you have other species growing in your garden, if you have notice other ones growing in your walk, there's obviously a lot more than the 20 that are out there. Um, so you can record them all, yeah. That's brilliant. Um, somebody here has searched in Zoe Devlin's book for the opposite-leaved golden saxifrage, and yeah. it's not there. So, is there any alternative names that it's known by? Uh, it's it it should be in the the Wildflowers of Ireland book, um, but it's it could be on it could be near the back of the book in the kind of the small flowers, kind of the 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 maybe kind of green and yellow kind of flowers at the back. I know there's a, there's, it's definitely on our website anyway. And as far as I know, it's in the, it's in the Wildflowers of Ireland book. Um, but I can, if, if that person thing, I can, I can probably send them on the page for that uh, and send them on the web page of it as well. So I suppose the next question is probably for both of you because it's, will there be a talk on summer wildflowers so that we can submit records of these two? Mm -hmm. So I presume that is, will there be a summer wildflowers pro? recording thing and then would we do the talk about it well i suppose um there's no dedicated uh summer wildflower summer wildflowers recording form uh or program purely on the basis of the fact that uh you know everything is in flower uh basically so it's it's general kind of botanical recording but again if if there's no if there's interest for you know kind of going through um you know maybe we could do something you know maybe the the top 20 most commonly flowering uh, species found in summer um, like, I mean, you can actually find the, find out what species are flowering in your county, uh, all from the citizen science portal as well. So, I mean, we could actually do one based on, say, the records that came in for 2020 in Waterford. We could go through, um, we could go through the top 20 most common ones for those if, if, if there's enough interest and people are willing to be uh, talked at again by myself. <laughs> Well, just to, to jump in there, Oshin, to say that we've been completely blown away by the interest in, in this week. So you can get in touch with us um, at our at EU, EU Direct on Facebook or Twitter, or you can email us at Europe Direct at Waterford uh, Council. A, or just, just reply to one of the many emails you would have got from us this week. So now, now that we know where you are in the National Biodiversity Data Centre, there's certainly the, the interest there to run to run future talks. 
Yeah. Perfect. Have we any more questions? Oh, there's, there's a couple more. So do we have time for a few more? Oh yeah. yeah. I'm good yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so the first, there's another person wants to know, is it okay to leave non-native species such as the three-cornered garlic run wild or should they be, should they be left unchecked to spread? Um, I, I suppose it's, it depends if they're, you know, if it's something that's in your garden and you can, and you know, it's, it's something you want to control yourself. If it's, if it's in a, a public area, then to be honest, a lot of these species, I mean, when we say that they're non-native, um, it's, it's a very complex um, discussion, the whole native and non-native. Generally, with, with things that are native, um, we're, we're talking about things that are actually uh, been in Ireland uh, before the last ice age. So you're talking, you know, maybe 10,000 years ago. So it's, it's a thing people can often think in their heads. I mean, probably just to, like, sycamore isn't, a, isn't considered native in Ireland. Uh, beech isn't considered native in Ireland. Rabbit isn't considered native. You know, these are all introduced species. And I suppose the, the issue comes from is, if, is a species introduced and is it kind of an out-competing native species is really when, when things become an issue. I suppose something like the three-cornered garlic, again, I'd probably suggest if, um, if you were looking kind of for advice on kind of control or things like that, then maybe something like Invasive Species Ireland would be kind of, um, would, would be kind of the best kind of place to get in touch with because it is, it is a very tricky, um, it is a very tricky kind of balance to get as well. And I have somebody on a horticulture course and wood sorrel is classed as a weed on it. And they're just wondering okay. what it would be. Uh, well, I suppose um, if it's if it's the same wood sorrel as in the Oxalis cysticella, it's uh, it's a native species. So again, with, with horticulture, I have, I have no uh, kind of background in that. So I'm not certain, like, I mean, again, the whole thing is with um, with weeds, it really, it's, it's, it's a plant that you don't want growing in a, in a certain area like so if you know if you have um if you have a plant that's growing in your you know your bed of roses like you could consider that a weed or if you have roses growing where you're wanting your wild garden to be you could consider that a weed as well it's it's really more of a perception kind of thing um than than anything else but uh but yeah i suppose what you got there's probably a lot of native species that are probably considered kind of uh you know weeds for agriculture and horticulture yeah and um, any plants for the gardens that will, you could recommend for butterflies? Uh, I would, to be honest, I I'd probably be doing an injustice to all the, the stuff that's on the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. They're definitely the ones to, to go for for it because I could start listing plants all day here and probably still miss out on ones as well. Um, for kind of native things that, that are out there, um, something like the, the cuckoo flower, one of the things that often gets kind of dropped down is that people think about the, the food source um, as in like the adult food source, you know, so what the adult butterfly goes on to and, um, and nectar's on. But another really good thing is that, uh, and it's not always something people want to hear, is that uh, grasses, um, so all the brown butterflies that you see in Ireland use uh, different species of grass for uh, the larval food plant. And what we mean by larval food plant is that's what the actual caterpillar itself eats. So like we were talking about the orange tip butterfly, it used the, the cuckoo flower or the lady smock. Um, all the browns use grasses, things like small copper use docks, and probably one, if anyone has a nice tidy garden, I'm going to be shattering your world right now, but small tortoiseshell, red animal, and peacock all use nettles. So if there was one thing you could do, if you have nettles already there in your garden, to be honest, I'd be keeping them there and hoping uh, that you're going to get a, a kind of a mass of black caterpillars on it at some point, because you'll be getting the adults later on then as well. So it's, it's, it's good to think about the whole kind of life cycle of things, not just what the adults do. Perfect. Um, then somebody wants to: Is it necessary to follow the same route when surveying wildflowers? So, kind of, should you go the same route each day? No, you can you can basically do whatever you want. the The spring flowers project is it's completely kind of casual recording. Um, it's not like it's not a monitoring scheme, so you don't have to you know revisit the same site every couple of days or anything. Just wherever you're going on. Basically, I suppose, especially now, we're probably all feeling that, that we have our own kind of walking routes that are probably extremely well worn at this stage. But probably within your 5K, there's, there, there probably is, you know, one or two of these species at least, um, you know, that are in flower at the moment. And there will hopefully be many more. If anyone's lucky enough to have a woodland near them, then, then, you'll, definitely have, um, then you'll definitely have more of these species. But no, you can do it whatever way, um, whatever way you want, really. You can, you can record as much or as little as you want as well. Main thing is what you go is that you have fun with it and that you feel that you're kind of getting something back from it as well. So that would be the kind of the main take away from it as well and then somebody could you just remind people of the name of the app it's the biodiversity to? biodiversity data capture app i can add that to the to the email as well if you want or i can send it on as a as a, 
as another one, but it can be found on the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. So if you type in biodiversity, um, I think by the time you type in biodiversity, it's probably the only app that's there, but biodiversity data capture app. Yeah, now I don't know if, if this is your area of expertise. Somebody wants to know what they could do about moss taking over in a garden. Um, well, I suppose um, with moss, it's it's really a case like moss, uh, mosses are extremely resilient. Uh, and again, there's, there's hundreds of species uh, there and there's, you know, um, bryologists out there that would love to have a garden full of moss, but I understand it's not for everyone. Probably the main things for things like moss would be uh, drainage. You know, they love wet areas and they can survive a long time um, without water as well. Um, it is probably one of those things, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't be advocating any kind of like, uh, you know, inorganic chemicals for, for stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's, I suppose it's it, it's all part of nature as well. Um, the moss kind of is all is all part of that as well. So it's um, it, it can't all be I suppose uh, flashy flowers. <laughs> That's great, thanks. And uh, just kind of what one last question here: Where can you get native yellow rattle seeds? I heard it's good to suppress grass taking over a meadow. Yeah, so it is. It's a it's a hemiparasitic species, and it kind of feeds on the roots of the grasses. So it actually uh, kind of decreases their um, the the prevalence of grass and allows for more uh, actual native wildflowers to pop up in the area. Um, with native wild seed, um, I'd suggest to probably checking again on the on the pollinator plan. There's probably people that that that, that sell just native species. Anytime I've done it myself, I've just collected from. Um, just collected them in the wild or collected them from, you know, like a, an area where a friend would have it grown and things like that. You're, you have to kind of generally wait too much later in the season when you can hear the seeds rattling around in, in, the, in the seed pods. But definitely, yeah, it's um, the, the other name it kind of goes by is the, the meadow maker because it is, it is the thing that really it suppresses, as you say, it suppresses the grasses and uh, allows the, the native wildflowers an opportunity to, to actually come up. That's great. Thank you. I'm um, getting loads of thank yous in here in the chat and in the Q&A and just thanking everybody from this week for all the speakers and that. Um, and just our, our attendees are getting greedy now. They're looking for an autumn flowering program as well. <laughs> <laughs> we could be busy all year. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, a, a, a huge thank, thank you, Oshin, from, from myself and Sinead, and th that was a really, really great talk, and I, I'll be, be kind of spotting on my woodwalk now, and it's, it's, it's great to have so much information at our, our fingertips, and really exciting that the Biodiversity Centre is based here in Waterford as well. Yep. And then I'd just like to extend the um, thank you to all our audience who've been with us today and all week. And um, this has been our first week of online webinars, so it has been a nerve wracking and very exciting experience for us in, in equal measures. And all the talks, as we mentioned previously, are recorded on our, if you search for our Europe Direct Waterford YouTube channel, and all of the links to, to the presentation slides from all our speakers are on our website, waterfordlibraries.ie. And everyone after the talk today will be getting an email with, with your slides and all the links that you mentioned. So um, Europe Direct Waterford is run from Central Library here in Waterford, and it's one of a network of local contact points that serve as the first link between the citizens and the EU as institutions. So just thank you to uh, Sinead Cummins, who's been here with me all week, and to Annette and Noreen and Eleanor and Lucy, who've all been working away behind the, the scenes to make, to make our week biodiversity on the doorstep happen. So by the signs of it, Oshin, we'll be welcoming you back again for another talk before too Good long. Stuff. And, and thank you very, very much. No bother at all. Thank you all very much for coming along.